السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين My dear viewers welcome to another live edition of our program Ask Uda where you present your questions and we do our best to answer them in the light of the Quran and the sound sunnah of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم in order to do that we have some phone numbers which appear on the bottom of the screen. We do not charge anything for your calls. It is simply only your long distance calls if you're calling from overseas. Area code 002 0235532. Alternatively, area code 002 0105469323. Also, meanwhile, we're going live on the YouTube, on my web page, on um, Facebook page as well. Where I receive your questions and comments. I have some questions already. Rahun Ahmed Nizami, brother Rahun, is asking Is the money earned from using pirated software halal? No, it is not halal. So, if somebody is pirating softwares and selling them, this is not permissible because those who have made effort, researches, and spent years or months more or less in creating a software that makes it and developing a software that makes it easier for people to manage their business they are more worthy than anybody else to benefit out of that you know for you to pirate it to copy it without their uh, even though it has copyrights so if it has copyrights you're not allowed to pirate it and sell it and profit out of that may Allah guide us to what is best um, Shisita Anjum. Anjum is asking, I'm starting a business of women's clothing, which includes women's t-shirts, skirts, and western dresses. They can wear these clothes in front of their husbands or any uh, girls' college. I'm selling it. I had no consult with the buyer whether she is Muslim or non-Muslim or how they are using them. So is it permissible to do this business? And will my income be halal? I'm going to be honest with you, my dear brothers and sisters. This is one of the very tough questions. Because a tough question is not a question where you can say haram, end of story, close the chapter. No. The question which you have to investigate, you have to verify, you have to be careful before you utter the word halal. Uh, let me take this uh, call. Inshallah, I'll get back to you with answering the question about selling women's clothes. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Shuaib from United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Askoda. I'm doing fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Uh, Sheikh, my question has uh, two parts mm -hmm. and they are somehow uh, interlinked. Uh, my first part is uh, how to cleanse and purify the heart. Uh, most of the questions are asked about the outwardly deeds, about fiqh, uh, which I know is also very important, uh, like how to calculate the zakat, how to do the atkar, how to perform wudu, salah, etc. Uh, but a lot of people around who are practicing Muslims outwardly are very harsh, sometimes very rude and arrogant. Mm. And I have seen some non-Muslims who are more compassionate, more loving, and have a much softer heart. Mm. Uh, and this leads to my second part of the question is uh, some of my friends who stay outside in the European countries they feel that some Muslims are very harsh but the Christians are so heartwarming so welcoming so compassionate and they feel more love for people mm. and sometimes this confuses the mindset of the young Muslims they say that why does Allah say in the Quran that Christians and Jews can never be our friends although they are so loving and friendly so I want to know what exactly is wrong or missing because Muslims should be the most compassionate, they should be more loving. For example, some parents are very sometimes harsh and this, the, this turns away the kids from the religion because they 
they think my father has a big beard he prays five times a day but he's so rude his character is not good mm. and uh, i want to know how to rectify this how to work on constantly cleansing the heart and making it more softer because i believe i i also heard i don't know if this is true that uh, if the heart is hardened this is a form of punishment from allah taala and i want to know how to make the heart soft and be more merciful more kind and more compassionate all right thank you shoaib from united arab emirates before i get to your question i'd like to answer the previous question of andrew about selling women's clothes sometimes when you do that in uh, a muslim dominated society you sell it and you don't have any worry about that because you know that uh, muslim women normally wear hijab and wear aba so basically they're buying these clothes uh, for their houses or for the privacy among themselves and their women sisters friends and so on or for their parties so there is no problem in this regard but it becomes problematic when you know that you are selling some items which could be used properly or misused so if the person like if you're selling women's uh, sleepwear and lingerie I don't have to ask because normally these outfits are used in the bedroom and I don't have to chase the woman who's buying them to ask her whether she's married or having a boyfriend she's going to wear them for her husband or for an illicit relationship this is none of your business but I'm talking about you know when you see a girl who's not wearing proper clothes and she's coming uh, to buy like a pair of jeans tight jeans torn uh, from the bottom and from the knees and here and there and you know for sure that uh, I'm going to help her to wear that there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the second ayah of surah uh, al-ma'idah wala ta'awunu ala al-ithmi wal udwan and as I said repeatedly this ayah answers tons of questions most of our questions could be answered through this ayah do not help one another in doing any sin or transgression so not only the 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 person who is doing the sin is blameworthy but those who are assisting him or helping them they are also blameworthy because without their help they wouldn't have achieved committing that sin so as i said it is not easy to give you a short cut, cut answer and say it's always halal or it's always haram uh, if you are in a society where people normally wear hijab no problem because they would wear that at home but otherwise you will have to verify and may Allah make it easy for you obviously selling such items online it's almost impossible to verify so you don't have a problem with that may Allah uh, forgive us our shortcomings and guide us what is best Shuaib from United Arab Emirates MashaAllah brother Shuaib your questions have been answered entirely in a program which is aired normally on Mondays and Thursdays of every week which uh, Mondays and Wednesdays of every week which is called Gardens of the Pious we have spoken repeatedly about the importance of manners and moralities in Islam we have put a lot of emphasis on the fact that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said in one hadith I have been sent exclusively to perfect good manners we have discussed that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Aqrabukum minni majlisan yawm al qiyamah The closest to me on the day of judgment of all of you will be those who have the best of akhlaq and manners. He didn't discuss about those who used to pray at night awfully or duha or fast every other day. These acts of worship, of fasting, of offering the prayers, of giving in a charity, of performing multiple umrahs and hajj, are supposed to strengthen your tie to your Creator, your relationship to your Creator, and it bring you closer to your Creator. And furthermore, it improves your akhlaq, improves your manners and moralities. If that doesn't do that, then you better listen to the following. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told about a woman who awfully offers ibadat, acts of worship, the rituals. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, walakinnaha tu'thi jiranaha. But she's very rude to her neighbors. 
The Prophet ﷺ immediately issued the following verdict. He said, he of nar, she will be going to hellfire. If your uh, ibadah or acts of worship do not improve anything in you, then what is the purpose of offering the ibadah? إِنَّ صَلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ Take for innocence the prayers. Indeed, a salah, namaz, the prayers, stops a person from indecencies, from bad activities, from illicit relations, from foul language, from every evil. And similarly, that is the same reason why Allah have ordained fasting, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ In order to be righteous and pious and we give our 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 wealth alms in order to be purified so basically the acts of worship are supposed if the person offer them properly and rightly they're supposed to make him or her a good believer when you say in the west and some muslims misbehave and some people see non-Muslims uh, are, you know, kind of uh, better, softer in hearts, kinder. It happens. But I do not generalize. I have, uh, through my experience, many examples I can share with you of people, of non-Muslims who accepted Islam because of the manners of their Muslim neighbors, of their Muslim colleagues, professors, or teachers, classmates, co-workers that happens right so among Muslims there are some who are not really practicing Islam and among atheists and among non-Muslims and I'm following whatever faith there are those who are kind who are nice who are decent and the Quran acknowledged that and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam acknowledged that he said إِنَّ الْكَافِرَ إِذَا عَمِلَ حَسَنَةً أُطْعِمَ بِهَا طُعْمَةً فِي الدُّنْيَا such people, whenever they are being kind, good, nice, and decent, Allah the Almighty rewards them immediately in this dunya. He does not deprive them from their worth, right? When a Muslim does this, then he will be rewarded here and in the hereafter as well. As far as how to purify your heart, the best advice I can share with you is seek knowledge. Learning and not just reading a book on your own or listening to a lecture, attending halqas, listening to the you know proper shiuch and scholars, learning from their uh, you know knowledge from their teachings that will soften your heart and will tender your heart. Knowledge is already there; it's written in the books. I have filmed a, a long program for Iqra uh, TV. It's called Tendering the Hearts. It's about explaining chapter Bab al riqaq in the book of Imam Bukhari. Wallahi, if you read the chapter, it will definitely tender your heart. It will soften your heart. It will make you a very nice person. But what can you do with a person whose heart is already harsh? Whether it is cultural, whether it is because he's already involved in many other sins and he's addicted to them, so he doesn't absorb any guidance that happens. So we do not generalize. That's why in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah Almighty says, So even your enemies, maybe they're good, they have some goodness in them. Let not your enmity to some people make them make you be unjust to them unfair to them you know most of our deen instructions about akhlaq and manners yes I used to have a neighbor who was very keen to attend the prayer in the masjid but I, I usually he heard him beating his wife and she's screaming and he's insulting her so I figured that it is not going back and forth to the masjid and doing this physical part of the worship. It is rather benefiting out of your worship. On the other hand, I have seen many people, their prayer definitely stopped them from taking bribery, from stealing, and it encouraged them to render the amanat. So the prayer is supposed to improve the akhlaq. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, the best of manners are those who are best to their spouses, to their wives. Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli. Then he said, wa ana khayrukum li ahli. That is the best proof that this person is really cool or nice or well-mannered. How he treats his wife, how he treats his parents, how she treats her husband, how she treats her children. This is the ultimate proof that this person is nice or otherwise. May Allah guide us what is best. Purifying the heart begins with offering the ibadat properly. Secondly, seeking knowledge because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us that seeking knowledge will enlighten the person's mind and heart and will encourage the person to do what is good and to distance himself and herself from what is evil. قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوُوا الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And constantly make dua, asking Allah to purify your heart. Guess what? In the sound hadith, the mother of the believers, Aisha radiallahu anha said, I heard the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, in the depth of the night. He was praying night prayer. I heard him while he was in sujood, prostrating himself, reciting the following invocation. He said, Rabbi ati nafsi taqwaha, wa zakkiha anta khayru man zakkaha, anta waliyuha wa mawlaha. So he was asking Allah to purify his heart and to sanctify his soul. Who was asking Allah to purify his heart? The man with the purest heart ever, with the best soul ever. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what about anyone other than Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Indeed, we're more worthy to constantly ask Allah to purify our hearts. Barakallahu feek, Akhi Shu'aib from United Arab Emirates. Uh, Shaheen is asking, let me read the question. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh, since dua is better done with the praising of Allah first, then the sending, the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad, then making your personal dua. Can I do salawat for the Prophet Sallallahu in sujood? Yes, you may. You may send the peace and the blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu in the form of dua in your sujood as well. Uh, in the hadith when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's very interesting. A salah here does not refer to the actual uh, prayers or the physical prayers. Rather, it refers to sending the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. When you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whenever somebody has a mas'ala, an invocation, so he begins his invocation, obviously, after praising Allah, sending the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Then present your need. Oh Allah, you are my parent. Um, give me a child. Uh, give me a promotion in my job. Um, give me whatever of the matters of the dunya or the hereafter. Then you wrap up your invocation by again sending the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We have many athar confirming that every time a person sends the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it is definitely accepted. The most generous, the Almighty Allah, is not going to accept the first and the last and leave what is in between, which is your mas'ala and your invocation. So learn this nice etiquette. Every time you want to make dua, praise Allah, send the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad, Present your need, your mas'ala and dua. Then finally, send the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sister Zakia Khan is asking, after salam, would you please tell me if I want to change my son's middle name? Do I need to do akika again? Thanks. Now you don't have to do aqiqa again. Aqiqa is done only once, whether right at the time which is prescribed on the seventh day of the birth of the child 
and if one cannot afford it, maybe a week later, two weeks later, or whenever you can afford it. And if it is done once, then you don't have to do it again, even if you end up changing the name of the child. Uh, Farhana Ismail, please explain the answer to where is Allah. Many people say Allah is everywhere. I need a clarification. I was taught that, uh, okay, it's a long question, but uh, I will answer you, inshallah, in brief. And thank you, Sister Shaheen or Brother Shaheen and Emelin and all of you. If, if I have any inquiry about something that I have never visualized, and I can never visualize neither myself nor any human being, then whom shall I resort to? Like, if I'm asked whether there are angels or not, there are aliens or not, do jinn exist? Are there heavens and hellfire? You know, whom am I supposed to ask? Because so far, none of us have seen neither Al-Jannah nor An-Nar. None of us have seen any of the prophets. None of us have seen Allah the Almighty. So in this case, what is the ideal way of learning about the unseen Wahy, the revelation? For us Muslims, we are the luckiest people on earth. Why? Because we have the ultimate truth in the form of Wahy, revelation, which is the Quran. It never changed and it will never change. Okay, it is the ultimate truth. And it is also supported and explained by the other form of wahi, which is the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So let me ask Allah the Almighty, where are you? Where are you? Where do you exist? Can we find that in the Quran? I mean, your question is very valid, my dear sister. Sister Farhana Ismail. Your question is very valid. But as a human being, as somebody who have never seen Allah, I would have to present the question to the Prophet or to Allah. Prophet Muhammad have died more than 1400 years ago. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ever living. His word is living among us, the Quran. Is there an answer to this question in the Quran? Yes. Could this answer be you know, interpreted differently? Let's see. What is the first ayah? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. Clear? Where is Ar-Rahman? He's above Al-Arsh, the throne. And the throne is the greatest creature ever. Okay? Is there another ayah? There are many ayat talking about خلق السماوات والأرض في ستة أيام ثم استوى على العرش. ما لكم من دونه من ولي ولا شفيع سورة السجدة that's another ayah many ayat talking about the creation of the heavens and the earth in six days then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rose above the throne that's it the answer is very clear I don't need any sheikh to give me a different interpretation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his throne where is the throne that's another question how big is the throne? Previously I said it is the biggest creature ever. There is a difference between Arsh and Kursi. What is the greatest ayah in the glorious Quran? Ayatul Kursi 255, Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2. Why is it the greatest ayah? Because it's talking about the traits of Allah the Almighty. And in this ayah, Allah the Almighty says, وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ his Kursi has encompasses the earth, the heavens, and the earth. Oh, okay. What is Al Kursi? It is a footstool. So, what is Al Kursi to Al Arsh? It is like a ring, like a ring thrown in a plain or desert. Really? So, what is the heavens and the earth to Al Kursi? It's like a ring thrown in a desert. So, how could you imagine Allah the Almighty, who is above Al Arsh, to be? in a little tiny room like this or in dirty places just the answer of those who say he's everywhere he's like air like the oxygen that we breathe Allah didn't say that 
If it is so, he, he would have said it clearly. But he said he's above the throne. In many ayahs, no more interpretation. Close the chapter. How does he see us if we're hiding in a close, uh, in, in a room behind closed doors? That's another issue, which is because Allah the Almighty who has the most perfect traits. He said to Musa alayhi salam, إِنَّنِي مَعَكُمَا أَسْمَعُ وَأَرَى And he said in Surah Al-Mujadila, مَا يَكُونُ مِن نَجْوَى ثَلَاثَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ رَابِعُهُمْ وَلَا خَمْسَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ سَادِسُهُمْ وَلَا أَدَنَى مِن ذَلِكَ وَلَا أَكْثَرَ إِلَّا هُوَ مَعَهُمْ أَيْنَمَا كَانُوا ثُمَّ يُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا عَمِلُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ from these ayat, we know that there are no barriers between us and Allah. Allah hears everything, everywhere, even if it is an ant, this little black ant, on a dark night, on a dead stone. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would hear its sound, its heartbeat, its crawling. Why? Because He's a creator. Inna Allah bi kulli shay'in alim. Verily, Allah is fully aware of everything. Okay? That is the answer in brief. I guess we got to take a short break. And inshallah, when we come back, I will, uh, inshallah, be happy to answer some of your questions. So please stay tuned. are the transmitters of the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. They carried his message and his legacy generation after another. And they are the one who carried this light to the whole world. The Life of the Muslim Scholars is a new series on Huda TV. Through studying their life and exploring many aspects of their lives, we will come to learn so many lessons get motivated and inspired by their stories, by their dedication for Islam and for the legacy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. Through this series, I hope that it, we will be able, inshallah ta'ala, to get motivated not to achieve only success in the akhirah, but in dunya as well. Join me, Walid Basuni, in this new series on Huda TV about the life of the Muslim scholars. Looking forward to having you. Stay tuned. We are on air again. Glad tidings to Huda TV viewers worldwide for the resumption of live broadcasting on NowSat. We are now broadcasting on the advanced DVB-S2 system. Tune in using our new frequency, 12188 horizontal on NowSat. Please note, you will need to have a modern HD receiver in order to tune in. Enjoy your favorite edutainment programs with crystal clear resolution. Huda TV, a light in every home. book of Allah, the miraculous words of Allah, the light in the midst of all darknesses has so many rights on us. And because of that, we initiated Quran Circle. In Quran Circle 1, we listened to the entire Quran. This was a great blessing. <laughs> The Quran is both concise and 
comprehensive. It has all aspects of guidance to all mankind. And because of that, in Quran Circle 2, we selected verses in every juz with a specific topic. We listened to the recitation and we reflected upon the meaning of that specific topic. <laughs> Each surah in the Qur'an, every chapter of the Qur'an has an objective. We looked into the objectives of the surahs that we chose and selected in Qur'an Circle 3. Brothers and sisters, take advantage of this opportunity. Get your mushafs, open it, follow with us with the recitation. We will choose surahs in the Quran for us to reflect upon. So let's take advantage of it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, to remind you with our phone numbers on the bottom of the screen and I have many questions, mashallah. Uh, let me take this question. Uh, Bashara Alawi. The question says after salam, how many days qualified for Salatul Qasr? For example, I stay in one place. Uh, from three to five days should I pray Qasr or uh, Fard Jazakumullahu Khairan Jazana wa Iyakum whether you pray Fard or whether you pray Qasr or Full it's called Fard because what you shorten of the prayer is a Fard prayer not the Nafila and as a matter of fact because this question is pressing you know many people travel and they want to know whether they can shorten the prayer or not combine the prayers or not and if they get to shorten and combine the prayers for how many days? And you would hear different opinions. You would hear the madhab of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal saying, for instance, if you intend to stay more than four days, so four days are okay, you still shorten the prayer. More than four days, then you pray full and you pray on time and you pray regular, like if you're resident. Why? They said because the Prophet sallallahu on the farewell Hajj arrived to Mecca on Sunday, it was the fourth. And he stayed there Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then he left to Mina on Thursday. So long as he was in Mecca, he was praying Qasr. Okay, that's a sound hadith agreed upon its authenticity. So we know that there is no hadith in which Prophet Muhammad said, you may shorten the prayer if you are traveling for three days, four days, 10 days, 15 days. And that's why there is a difference of opinion because the scholars have exerted their effort in the light of their education and the available references based on the actions, the various actions of the Prophet ﷺ, not on an explicit reference. If there was an explicit reference, that would be uh, over. The ayah of Surah An-Nisa, it, it allows us to shorten the prayer if we're traveling. But it doesn't speak about the distance, nor does it speak about the time frame, the limit. So this is the opinion of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, which is known as the Hanbali school of thought of fiqh. We have Al Imam Malik and Imam al-Shafi'i, Muhammad ibn Idris Shafi'i, may Allah bless on them, that are of the view that, well, if you intend to stay four days, so Ahmad ibn Hanbal, more than four days. But Malik was Shafi'i. If you already intended to stay four days, okay, other than the day of traveling and the day of arriving, then you pray regular and you pray nawafil and everything, you will be treated as resident. Which means, in simple words, that you are allowed to shorten the prayer if you're traveling only for three days. Okay, what about Imam Abu Hanifa? Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said 15 days and he has also uh, you know 
a valid point and a strong reference. We'll discuss that briefly, inshallah, right now. The scholar whom many people accuse of being extreme, harsh, and his views are very burdening, always presents, or in many masail presents, the easiest view. His view, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on him, his view is that there is no limit of three days, four days, or 15 days. Rather, if you travel for education, if you stay for a whole year, shorten the prayers, and you may combine them too. If you're traveling for business, you're staying for a month or two or three. Uh, even you rented your own house or you bought it, but you're just visiting for trade or business, even if you're staying for months or for years. Only when you decide that I'm going to change my residence and I'm going to live here for good. This is going to be my place. I will get married. I have kids. This is now going to be my country. Like most people when they travel to the States or to Europe. In this case, you get to pray regular. So Imam uh, Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah's views is the easiest and it's a valid view. We know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the battle of Tabuk he stayed on the battlefield for 20 days and he was shortening the prayers. That's more than four days. Adi argued but because he never intended to leave tomorrow or day after tomorrow. He kept postponing so he didn't know exactly when he was he leaving. And on the day of the conquest of Mecca, 19 days and he was shortening the prayer as well. The more right view and Allah knows best is the first view which is uh, the four days and if you stay more than that, you get to pray full, and you pray regular, and you pray the nawafil. But if somebody took the concession and the license or the opinion of Yama or Hanifa or otherwise, it is valid as well. May Allah guide us to what is best. Um, uh, Hajara Naki is asking after salam is it compulsory for ladies to put on socks while praying well according to the more right view and for your own safety of your ibadah yes there are some ahadith in this regard we normally discuss the hadith of Umm Salama which means when I say there are some ahadith and different opinions there are different opinions but not to jeopardize your ibadah uh, you should wear socks while uh, praying because according to the hadith of Umm Salama the feet of a woman in the prayer is our in the prayer and outside the prayer um, Kendrick G. Lyon Kendrick Lyon is asking how can I fear Allah I really want to fear Allah and do good deeds Wallahi that's a very good question and I think we all need to learn how to fear Allah the Almighty. That can be also achieved through the following. Studying the ayat of the Quran. When Hudhaifa ibn al-Yaman, may Allah be pleased with him, joined the Prophet sallallahu he found him praying at night, so he joined him. And then he said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, started reciting a long recitation, Surah Al-Baqarah, then Al-Nisa, then Ali Imran, such long recitation. And whenever he would pass by ayat al-azab, an ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns against his punishment, he would pause and he would seek refuge with Allah against his torment. Whenever he would recite ayat al-rahmah, an ayah which includes mercy of Allah, he would pause and he would ask Allah for his mercy. Studying the Quran will do it all. Studying the Quran will do it all. When somebody consulted a scholar and said that I cannot quit sinning. I cannot quit sinning. Help me. How can I quit? I'm addicted to some particular sins. He said, no problem. If you want to commit uh, a sin and you don't worry about it, make certain that when you commit a sin, you commit a sin under a heaven which does not belong to him and on an earth which does not belong to him and somewhere where he does not see you. So he said, but there is no such place. Everywhere belongs to him. And even if I hide behind closed doors in the darkness of my room, he will still see me. 
He said, you see, this is what you need to realize that you're being watched all the time. You know when they say on the phone when you hear a trick or a click or noise, then you joke about it and say, oh, it sounds like we have a big brother. Somebody's on the phone. So be careful. Why? Because nowadays everyone is spying on everyone. And there is no law and order when it comes to spying, by the way. So you become very careful. Why? Because you fear the consequence of your statement. And it could be used against you. If you read the ayat and the, subhanAllah, the Quran kept perfect balance between the bishara and the warning, the glad tidings, and the warning, bashira wa nadira. When you read those ayat, then you would realize that it is not always as you think that Allah the Almighty will forgive everyone and everyone will be cool and everyone will go to paradise. How do you know? Studying the athar, studying the athar of the predecessors, the companions. How Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, whom the Prophet وسلم, prophesied, number one, he has informed him that he is number one in the list of the ten heaven-bound companions. The first of Al-Asharatul Mubasharin Abil Jannah. Number two, on the Day of Judgment, the eight gates of heaven will call upon him, O oh, Abu Bakr, come and enter through me. Yet Abu Bakr Siddiq is still worried. Umar al-Khattab, uh, after he was stabbed and he died as a martyr while he was leading the prayer in the mihrab of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Abdullah ibn Abbas came to assure him that Prophet Muhammad was very happy with you, he announced that you'll be among Ahlul Jannah, Abu Bakr was happy with you, all the Ummah are happy with you. He said, I swear to Allah, لو أن لي طلاع الأرض ذهبا لفتديت به قبل أن ألقى الله If I have the whole earth of gold I would rather give it as a ransom to ransom myself before I meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So those people realize that it is not as what we think that there is always you know pardon forgiveness and mercy there is definitely but there is balance between hope and fear Right? So we gotta pray, we gotta do our best, and we gotta fear that it may not be accepted. And this fear is what will stop us from indulging into the sins and committing the mistakes. Some people, that fear will stop them, will distance them from committing the sin. And some people will not do it because they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It depends which category do you belong to. So you have to work on that category in order to make you a better believer, to bring you closer to Allah, to distance you from the sin. Study the Quran. Study the Sunnah. And learn a lot. That will develop both hope and fear. Um, let me see. Uh, my question is from Emelin Martaja. If I meet a person like this, shall I continue? It seems like you have... Uh, an upper part of the question. I met a friend and she was surprised that I changed because I'm wearing my hijab and abaya uh, or long dress. She committed that there is nothing written in the Quran that women shall cover their heads. I explain as I can. I started to be afraid to say something not to be corrected so I stopped arguing. What shall I say when I meet a person like this? Wallahi, it is very unfortunate that those who argue this argument are mainly among the Arab women, to be honest with you, the secular Arab. And they are very ignorant. I mean, they argue with no knowledge whatsoever. What if I present the ayah to you? Not, this is not the only argument, Emily. They argue that, oh, okay, I, I got it. But the ayah says, uh, you know, for the wives of the Prophet and for the daughters of the Prophet, not for all Muslim women. I did once give the khutbah 20 years ago in the States and after the khutbah, you know, I made mention of uh, the veil. And one sister approached me and said, I always thought that hijab is only mandatory upon the Arab in the Gulf because it's hot there. So there are two types of people, one who doesn't know and needs clarification. 
once I clarified to the sister, from that day she kept on the hijab. She never took it off. I mean in public, obviously. And the other type of people who are argumentative, and their argument is just for the sake of arguing. And Allah the Almighty warned against such people and said, وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ أَكْثَرَ شَيْءٍ جَدَلًا Like an namrud whom Ibrahim السلام, argued with him and he established the proof, but he was awful. Out of pride, out of vanity and kibr, he still argued. So he received the worst torment in this life, in addition to the worst torment in the hereafter. Now, did Allah the Almighty say that women should cover up and cover their heads and hair and bosom and their shins and their knees or not? Yes, he did. Is that, is, is that is something mentioned in the Quran? It is mentioned in the Quran. And all Arab, with simple Arab, with simple Arabic language, will perceive it. And if you read the literal translation and the rough translation of any language, he will translate it as is. So we have in Surah Al Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 59. Beautiful ayah. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيُّ قُلْ لِأَزْوَاجِكَ وَبَنَاتِكَ وَنِسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ O the Prophet, command your wives, your daughters, and guess what? The Muslim women, نِسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يُدْنِينَ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ جَلَابِي بِهِنَّ ذَلِكَ أَدَنَا أَنْ يُعْرَفْنَ فَلَا يُؤْذَيْنَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا To lower their jalabib, their garments, to lower them from where to where, from top to bottom. That is the jilbab. You know the aba which you wear while offering the prayer? That is the jilbab. And if you look into the other ayah of Surah An Nur 31, but let me take this call first. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Shihab from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, yeah, Assalamu alaikum. How are you, Sheikh? Doing fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking, Brother Sheikh. Yes. Welcome to the program. Uh, I say to my parents to read the translation of the Quran, but they undermine the translation. They think it's not reliable. Also, I say to my mother that Allah said in the Quran that He will preserve the Quran. That He will only preserve the Arabic version. So I don't know what should they do. You, you, also, you, my father also said that everyone has, uh, is own way of interpreting the Quran. Uh, so your parents are Muslims, Shihab, right? Yes. And where are you guys originally from? Uh, my parents are originally from Pakistan. Okay, okay. Taib. Jazakallahu um, khairan. Well, it is definitely true that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا We have sent it down as an Arabic Qur'an. And that is the preferred language to recite the Qur'an with. And Allah the Almighty said, He have made it easy for people to learn it, to recite it, to memorize it, to understand it, and so on. وَلَقَدْ يَسْتَرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِذِكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكَرِ And there is an immense reward in learning how to read the Qur'an and how <clears throat> and how to recite the Quran the same way that Prophet Muhammad and his companions used to recite it. There is no doubt in that regard. Also, there is no doubt that each Muslim have to offer the five daily prayers, right? And each Muslim have to recite Quran in the four rakahs, in each rakah that he or she prays. And how do you recite the Quran? In the language it was revealed, right? So these are all proofs that we have to learn the minimum requirement to enable us to recite the Qur'an properly. Now there is a huge package of reward for learning how to recite the Qur'an properly, not just to offer the prayers, but to recite it on a regular basis. And not only to recite it on a regular basis, but to understand it further in the language it was revealed with. When somebody says that everybody have their own version or interpretation of the Qur'an, I gotta tell you that this is not true. This is not true. And maybe you don't know, so let me teach you. But I hope you're not arguing for the sake of argument. 
okay? Because the Quran, no one has the right to interpret any of its words or ayat on their own. No. Even the companions of the Prophet ﷺ did not dare to give any interpretation of the Quran without resorting back to him if there is anything that they didn't understand. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an was perfectly erred. He understood every word in the Quran, but when it comes to ta'wil, when it comes to interpretation, he abstained. No. He said, where can I hide from Allah if I dare to interpret or deliver my personal opinion on any of Allah's statement? So how do we learn the tafsir, the meaning of the Quran? It's simple. It's easy. But it is not as your daddy thinking that everyone have their own different interpretation. That is absolutely not true. It is similar to the other sister who is calling that somebody is telling her there is no uh, hijab in the Quran because she misunderstood the ayah. No. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an was caught in a hadith and a woman said from Iraq said that, uh, how dare you say that? He said, this is what Allah said in the Quran. He said, she said, no, but I read the Quran from cover to cover and I didn't find anything, such thing. He said, have you read it? You would have found it. It's in Surah al hash But you misunderstand the ayah or you do not comprehend the meaning of the ayah. وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُمْ You know, Brother Shihab, I just realized that it's been 10 years we have a program called Correct Your Recitation. The first segment have our, we recite the ayat and we give the tafsir. I don't give any personal tafsir. I'm just a transmitter. I say this is what Ibn Abbas said, this is what Hudhaf al-Maliman said, this is what Umar Khattab said, you know, because I cannot interpret the Quran on my own. So I only transmit. So I study from all these authentic references and I present to you the most authentic version. It's been already more than 10 years and we are in the 26th part of the Quran. Can you imagine? So we have a long journey, a long way to go. We need to learn. Uh, you think that anyone can read an ayah, understand it on their own, uh, at least open the tafsir of Ibn Kathir open the abridged tafsir of Ibn Kathir in order to learn supported by a hadith or an opinion of Mujahid or Ibn Abbas or in order to understand the meaning of the ayah. Not true that everyone have their own interpretation of the Quran. No, this is not true. May Allah the Almighty guide us to what is best. Uh, and we ran out of time so we'll continue inshallah in the next episode. Until then, Assalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen, Allah.